Hi, I'm Alec Jason. The subject here is the use of deadly force in self-defense. It is a very important social subject, yet one which is, I believe, generally obscured from serious public discussion or examination. Now, those in law enforcement receive substantial training on the use of deadly force, as I did when I was a police officer. But most people will never hear the subject formally presented. Have you ever seen a Time magazine cover on self-defense, a community college class on the topic, or been invited to attend a class on the legal aspects of self-defense by your local police department? Probably not. I think the use of deadly force requires serious deliberation, and that's why I'm here. Owning a firearm for personal protection and even possessing the technical skill to use it is not enough in our modern law-based society. One crucial element is often neglected by gun owners. The difficult question of when a firearm can legally be used for personal protection. A clear explanation of the legal aspects of using a gun in self-defense is very hard to find, and there are not many places you can go for valid help. You could try calling your local police department or district attorney's office, and you'll find that they're, they're not going to be very eager to explain it to you. Because most police administrators and prosecuting attorneys are very reluctant to discuss the matter in detail with someone they don't know. Why? Because they're afraid you're going to hang up the phone, go out and shoot someone, and later tell the police and the press something like, oh, I don't know why I was arrested. I did it the way Sergeant Jones of the police department or Mr. So-and-so of the DA's office told me. He said it would be legal. I recognize the fact that it is very difficult for the average citizen to get good information on this subject, and that's why I made this documentary. Now, I am not an attorney, and although you will be hearing the opinions of several qualified attorneys and other experts, you must understand that the information you're about to hear can only be used as general guidelines on the subject of self-defense, not as final definitive conclusions. Now, I wish I could present you with the self-defense commandments carved in stone, but it can't be done by me or anyone else. There are several good reasons for this. You should be aware that the current law is describing what is and what is not considered to be justifiable use of deadly force are subject to change. Another problem is that we have 50 states all with their own laws on the subject. While most agree on the basic elements of the use of deadly force in self-defense, some states apply different standards which could very seriously affect you. Now later on, we'll tell you some methods of finding out about your own state's laws. Now I am not attempting to encourage anyone to go out and buy a gun for self-defense. This documentary was made in the recognition of the fact that while there are millions of people in this country who own guns for self-defense, very, very few possess a good, practical understanding about when they legally can and cannot use them. I believe those people need to know what we are about to present. My purpose here is not to convince anyone to own a gun for self-defense or to urge anyone to use a gun against another person. You can make those decisions yourself, but I will urge certain otherwise responsible people not to own firearms, people who will not take the steps to safeguard them from children and from criminals, and to those who own a firearm for self-defense yet who are not prepared to use it. To illustrate my last point, let's take a look at a dramatic recreation of a criminal incident.
have to put up with sneak aroma any longer. You can stop sneak aroma with Keep It In Your Sneaker. Hold on. It's a mistake. It's just a mistake. I'm in the wrong house, okay? I'm in the wrong house. Get out of here! Listen, I made a mistake. It's Get out of here! I'm gonna leave. <laughs> Listen, maybe we should talk about this. No! I don't want to talk. Get out of here! You don't want to hurt me. I haven't done anything, lady. I, you can't shoot me. I haven't done anything. Easy, easy. Get easy. off my bed! Easy. Don't get any closer! I'm hurt you. Now listen. Put the gun down. I'm telling you to put no. the gun down. I'm gonna shoot you. Put your gun down. Lady, if you shoot me, you're gonna be in big trouble because I haven't done anything. You know that. You know that. Okay? Put it down. Put it down. Just relax and put it down. You don't you know better than that. You know better. Come here, princess. Okay, princess. No! You're gonna no. enjoy this. You are gonna enjoy this. Now I want you to know something. I can shoot you. You wanna know why? Do you wanna know why? I'm doing sacred Please, things. No. Sacred things. <clears throat> now, I want you to relax. I want you to relax. Easy. Because I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Just relax. You need to make a contribution. A contribution. Just relax. And I want to tell you something. Don't worry. Because you're going to be a big one. You're going to be a big one. Now, kiss my hand. So just relax. We'll discuss if and when that young woman was legally justified in using deadly force to protect herself later on. But first, there's something else to learn from that woman's horror and tragedy. We saw a young woman who tried to do the right thing to protect herself from an intruder. The smartest thing she could have done would probably have been to run out the patio door immediately and go to a neighbor to call the police. But as we saw, she immediately grabbed her gun the one she kept for self-defense, and attempted to call the police. But when the intruder returned and advanced towards her, she was either confused by his talk or unprepared emotionally and or morally to use the gun against him, which then transformed her gun from a potentially life-saving tool into a liability against her. The point here is that if someone is unprepared psychologically, morally, or just too confused to use a gun by lack of basic legal knowledge, then that person has two choices. Either get rid of the gun or make the effort to prepare oneself legally and morally to use it when and if that time comes. Before we go any further, let's hear from one of the country's top experts on the legal aspects of self-defense. Attorney Richard Seldine recently retired as a special trials prosecutor with the Los Angeles, California District Attorney's Office where he prosecuted thousands of felons with only three not guilty verdicts in 23 years of trial experience. He is now in private practice specializing in self-defense cases. I asked him to discuss when a firearm can legally be used in self-defense. Now, well, you have to understand that any taking of a human life is a homicide. All right. If it's unlawful, it's murder. If it's lawful, it's either excusable homicide or justifiable homicide. Under justifiable homicide, self-defense is one of the times that a killing can be legally justified. Uh, killings in protection of habitat are legally justified. Killings in, uh, in uh, preventing a felony. Uh, uh, when I say felony, they're talking about atrocious felonies. They redefine that. Uh, is a justifiable homicide. So cutting it down to just one little area of self-defense, when are you justified? You're justified when you have a reasonable belief based on the facts that your life or someone else's life or your body is subject to possible great bodily injury at that moment. At that point, you're justified in using deadly force. And kind of a barometer that I use is if when you do the shooting, 
your hands are ice, that's self-defense. If you do the shooting and your ears are burning, that's murder. So you can see how any set of facts uh, can give you either a self-defense or a murder, depending on the intent. Now, whether or not that intent will be able to be proved is another question. It's obvious somebody comes through your window and is standing there in your house having just broken in. You, nobody's going to believe you shot him for sport. But I guarantee that if your hands are ice, you shot in self-defense. But if your ears are burning, you did it because that son of a gun broke in your house, nobody gets away with that. When uh, you're subjected to circumstances that give you uh, fear, then uh, the body closes down the blood vessels and your hands and extremities become extremely cold to prevent hemorrhaging if something should happen out there. Uh, in a self-defense situation, if uh, you're experiencing those phenomenon, you know, or somebody else would grab your hand at that point, would know you're actually in fear. You're afraid of great bodily injury or death. If you don't have those symptoms, if, if uh, you're sitting there with perfectly warm hands and your ears are burning because you're burned up at this guy, then uh, you're not acting out of fear, you're acting out of another emotion and under those circumstances, technically, uh, you're not uh, able to avail yourself of self-defense. Uh, the law states that if you are subjected to a situation that you reasonably fear great bodily injury or death, you're justified in taking a human life. And that is the key. If the situation on its surface is apparently that, but you acted out of another motive, then legally you're not entitled to self-defense. And I have seen cases where the uh, objective surroundings of the shooting indicated clearly that this was self-defense. But then when background investigations were done, it was uncovered that this person was merely waiting for an opportunity to avenge a wrong. And one case I'm thinking about was a case where in a dice game, someone felt they had been uh, uh, deprived of some money that was owed. And they started to badger the person uh, who they felt owed them the money. And this person wasn't too dumb. And he said, come on over to my house, I'll pay you. And as this person approached, he got to the front door and the person said, in some forms of vulgarity, to go to hell. This outraged the person who was owed the money and he kicked in the door. Well, when the police got there, the door was kicked in. There's a man lying dead. That's justifiable homicide. However, when they interviewed the people at the uh, crap game, it became obvious that he had enticed that person back there for the purposes of killing him. So objectively, that was a justifiable shooting the bottom line was he went to state prison. But let's see part of that dramatic scene again. <laughs> Hold on, lady. Hold on. It's a mistake. It's just a mistake. I'm in the wrong house, okay? I'm in the Hold on. Get out of here. Listen, I made a mistake. It's Get out of here. I'm going to leave. <laughs> Listen, maybe we should talk about this. No. I don't want to talk. Get out of here. You don't want to hurt me. I haven't done anything, lady. I, you can't shoot me. I haven't done anything. Easy, easy. Get off my bed. Don't get any closer. I'm hurt you. Now, in this situation, this woman certainly had a reasonable fear for her life and was justified in using her gun. Several factors give her justification. One, he was in her home where he had no right to be. Two, he did not leave when ordered to do so. Three, he advanced towards her. Now, a reasonable person could assume that by his continually moving towards her, he was in the commission of a robbery, that he intended to forcibly take her gun from her and do her great bodily harm. Now, one of the keys to understanding legal self-defense is in the definition of reasonable fear. The law states, and when I say the law, I'm referring to the jury instructions. For example, the ones I have in front of me. Uh, you take 12 people who have no knowledge whatsoever of the law, and at the end of the case, after they've heard the facts, the judge will tell them, this is what the law is. And you have to take those facts that you've heard and apply it to this law. And the judge will say to the jury, bare fear alone is insufficient to justify a homicide. It must be a reasonable fear, and that reasonable fear is what a reasonable person would do under like circumstances and feel under like circumstances. And basically, though the judge doesn't say this to the jury, that reasonable person is the combined intelligence of those 12 people. And that's where you come up with whether it was reasonable or not. Now, if you uh, take any factual situation, 
uh, whether or not it's reasonable will depend upon the 12 people who are making that call. At the police level and at the district attorney level, uh, this is sort of a standard. And uh, we'll say, yeah, that's a situation where there's sufficient fear. We'll say, no, that situation doesn't apply. But when you get in the courtroom, anything can happen. And uh, that's up to what those 12 people perceive society to be. The distinction between the two emotions, anger and fear, is very important to understand. Anger alone cannot justify the use of deadly force. Can you be justified in shooting because you lost your Never. Temper? No, there's, there's, there is no justifiable homicide for anger. The, uh, I mean, that's just plain out and out murder. Another expert on the subject is attorney and police officer Jeffrey Chudwin, who has worked for over eight years as an assistant state prosecutor in the Chicago area. Now in private practice, he teaches courses on the legal aspects of the use of deadly force to both police officers and civilians. I asked him about anger as a justification. Well, first of all, if you're going to try to defend your actions on the basis that you're an angry young man, nobody's going to buy it. Because the jury has to follow a set of instructions. And let's assume for a moment that we have a case where an individual has acted and that action has led to the injury or death of another person. That the authorities of that area have looked at the case, said it's not justified, and charged it criminally. And he gets up before that jury and he tells his story. He says, I was angry. My emotions were running wild. I could not control myself. Regardless of what he says and the evidence that is introduced, and along with it, the judge will then read a set of jury instructions to the jury that they have to make their deliberation on. And remember, that jury is sworn to follow the law. So the judge gives them the instructions. And those instructions will not tell them that an individual is authorized or justified under the law to use deadly force when he becomes angry. It's as simple as that. You should remember that whenever restrictions on the use of a firearm is discussed, it also applies to other potentially deadly objects such as knives, hatchets, tire irons, baseball bats, and so on. One word you've already heard several times and you will hear again is justification. Now I asked Dick Seldine to discuss the legal concept of justification in the use of deadly force and how it translates from your interpretation at the time of, a, of an event to the interpretation of others after the fact. Uh, the, your, the other person being attacked, first of all, you will never, ever convey in the courtroom what you experienced in the street. You don't have the ability to do that. and You won't be allowed to do it by our system because the, this is the way questions are asked and answered and rules of evidence. So you may have total uh, commitment and feel that this was a justifiable killing, but now that we allow the smoke to settle and start looking at the facts, uh, all of a sudden uh, the distance away at the time the person was approaching, uh, the uh, clothing you had on, these factors start coming into it. Uh, I know if I were walking down the street and uh, five bikers cut me off and started to advance towards me and it, it was no one else around, at that point I fear great bodily injury. Now if I take out my SIG 230 and I put five holes and there's five dead bodies, I don't think there's a jury in the world going to acquit me. They haven't done anything except approach and you kill five men. But in my mind at that point, if they get any closer, I've got big problems. So there's certain areas you can't just draw a line. You can't just say, hey, you're okay, you can use it now. You gotta remember, first of all, you gotta live, or all this is irrelevant. If you're unfortunate enough to have made a call and taken a life in a situation that somebody's gonna second guess and put you in a courtroom, you better have a good lawyer. If you have a good lawyer, you'd probably be all right. Okay. Uh, when you get to the police officer situation, he's going to look at the circumstances through his eyes. A police officer probably would say five bikers approaching on you. That's great bodily injury written all over it. Will 12 jurors who see these people only as the uh, sons and daughters of grieving parents 
see it the same way, that's another question. A very important element in the use of deadly force for self-defense lies in your understanding of the legal definition of being in fear of death or great bodily injury. To explore the concept, I asked Dick Seldin about being attacked by someone who does not have a weapon. Now, in such a situation, could you still reasonably fear for your life or for great bodily harm? I hate to sound like I'm hedging. No, bare hands can never justify the use of deadly force. So when you threw that last one in there, uh, in no situation, let me take that back because in the law there is no such thing as no situation. If you had a karate expert that had just chopped three people in half in front of you and came towards you, you'd be justified in using deadly force. But 99% of the situations that come into a courtroom, you cannot use deadly force to repel an unarmed attack. Uh, that you could vary that if you had uh, an 83-year-old woman being attacked by a six-foot-five-inch uh, assailant. But as a general purpose, somebody like yourself, it's a bare-fisted attack. You cannot use deadly force. Now, what constitutes great bodily injury is a, I hate the hedge. That's what I was getting to. I hate the hedge, but that really depends upon what the person looking at the circumstances thinks is the worst thing that could have happened to you. Now, you may say, uh, gee, I was afraid I was going to get a broken arm. That's great bodily injury to me. You could run into a group of jurors that say, so he gets his arm in a sling, you didn't have to kill the guy. All right. Generally, though, uh, an attack with some type of weapon, uh, ipso facto, indicates you're going to end up in the hospital with broken bones and stitches. Legally defined, great bodily injury is a broken bone, any type of injury requiring uh, sutures, any permanent disfigurement, and any uh, loss of consciousness for an extended period of time would be considered great bodily injury when, as a prosecutor, we seek to enhance sentences for causing great bodily injury, that'd be the definition at that end. So I think you could apply the same thing, that if a person were coming at you with a baseball bat, I think 12 people automatically would say, if he got that baseball bat on his head, that's great bodily injury. If uh, the same person were coming at you with a tennis racket, who knows? And I mean, that's a call, it's a factual call. But that would give you the parameters that you're looking at. You've heard described and discussed several situations in which the use of deadly force can be justified. But before we go any further, it is very important that you are fully aware of one situation in which the use of deadly force is not justified. And that is the case of the fleeing criminal, the bad guy who is running, driving, or just walking away. Now, in spite of what you've seen in the movies and on TV, you cannot use deadly force against someone just to prevent him from getting away. Dick Saldin explains it in terms of a homeowner shooting as a burglar flees out a back door. No, definitely not. As far as self-defense, at that point, you'd be hard-pressed to convince the jury that this was a shooting to prevent a felony. And then you also have a problem convincing the jury that you, you were fearing great bodily injury or death because he is in the process of fleeing a location. So I would say the private citizen should not shoot uh, a fleeing suspect. Though there are circumstances where if the person is fleeing in the sense of uh, <laughs> he's just shot at you six times, he's running his car to get more bullets. Well, it's obvious there that he still continues to be a threat and you could shoot him under those circumstances. But if he's fleeing and leave the scene and leave you alone, then uh, you shouldn't shoot. Let's have a look at a recreated incident. It was late at night. Mary Scott, a doctor working in a downtown hospital, was taken at knife point into her own car, tied up, and taken out into a rural area. For almost two hours, she was brutally raped and beaten by a vicious criminal until she managed to jump out of the car wearing only a lab coat. Put it 
down. Get back! Put it down, down now! I'm really gonna fuck you up. Josh, you got any closer now? Get back! Get back! What the hell is going on out here? Shut him! He raped me! Give me the gun! No! 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 Give me no! No! Should the man with the shotgun have shot at the rapist? Should he have let the woman have the gun? Now, both answers are, of course, no. But do you understand why? There are several reasons why using deadly force was not justified. Okay, first, when Peters, that's the man who woke up and grabbed his shotgun, when he came outside, no one's life was in danger. Then the doctor ran to Peters saying she'd been raped and telling him to shoot the rapist. But you can't use deadly force just because someone asks you to. You've got to have a reason. There still was no threat to anyone's life. Now, when the rapist walked off, he was, he was getting away. But as you've learned, you can't use deadly force to prevent someone from just getting away. So how about letting her have, a, have the gun? Is that a good idea? Well, it's a very bad idea for several reasons, the most important of which is that in strange, sudden situations like the one we just saw, you don't really know what the facts are. You really don't know what's going on. Now, you knew the facts because I gave you a background to the scene as we started. But as all police officers quickly discover on the job, there are many, many times when things are not what they first appear to be, in spite of what people may be telling you. Now, that woman could have been a uh, uh, an escaped mental patient, or the injured and confused victim of an auto accident. I mean, life is not Hollywood. A lot of things are very unclear in real life. In the real world, you'll never get a background introduction. And the good guys and the bad guys are often very hard to tell apart. I imagine by now, you're starting to understand why there are few quick and easy answers to the questions of the use of deadly force and self-defense. Now, the purpose of this documentary is not to give you yes and no answers to cover all possible situations, but to give you a working comprehension of the current legal doctrine which you can use to come up with your own yeses and nos when you need to. Now, later on, I'll be giving you a chance to analyze more reenacted criminal events. So listen carefully to our experts, and instead of trying to memorize what you hear, look for the guidelines, the principles involved in what's being said. To get a full picture of all this, you should learn how you will be regarded by those who will first be called upon to make judgments on your actions should you ever use a firearm in self-defense. At the time of the shooting, you have, first of all, an evaluation by the police officers in the field. And their basic attitude is, if the shooting takes place in a home, then uh, there will be no arrest. A report will be taken and turned over to the district attorney. If the shooting takes place in the street and the assailant is armed, that's the person who was killed, was armed, the chances are you probably will go home without being arrested. If it, if it takes place in the street and it's equal force, two armed people, or you're armed and he is not armed to your level, you'll be arrested. All right. At that point, either having been released and a report made, or having been arrested, the report will be then taken to the district attorney. And the district attorney will make an evaluation of the case and look at the surrounding facts. And when you look at those, uh, if it turns out that there were reasonable alternatives to the use of deadly force, there's a chance this case may go on, or if the story doesn't hold up. Right. So uh, you go from the police officer making an evaluation in the initial case, and he's driven by, for example, the record of the person you shot. If you have Charlie Manson laying there with five bullets in him, the police officer writes a report for you. 
if uh, you have the valid Victorian of uh, Compton Junior High, you have problems. Uh, when you get to the district attorney, you have no prior record. He's got a prior record. Uh, you're an upstanding citizen. Uh, the shooting took place under certain circumstances. Uh, you run into uh, their basically philosophy of the district attorney. In my case, I review the case, my feeling always was in the home, I was looking for a way to cut the person loose. I did not want to file on anyone that used deadly force in their home. I felt anyone that went into a home for any reason, uh, uh, burglary, uh, to commit a battery on somebody inside, an attempt to rape, or just in there when they shouldn't have been late at night, uh, a person does not, I feel, have to wait to see whether or not they can use uh, deadly force because they have their family to protect at that point. So I always looked for justification as a district attorney for allowing those cases to be rejected. When the shooting took place in the street, my perspective was differently. I looked at it at that point that why was the guy carrying a gun in the street if he didn't have a permit, number one? Was he looking for trouble out there with that, without the permit? And in the street, he hasn't got any greater rights than the person he killed. There's uh, escape avenues available to him. Let's hear from a police officer on what will typically occur when the police respond. Keith Costelny is the deputy chief in charge of investigations for the Will County Sheriff's Office, which covers a suburban area adjoining Chicago. After 17 years as a police officer, Chief Costelny has responded to many calls involving residential shootings. Responding to the door myself, I would uh, respond uh, with a firearm in my hand that there was a shooting that took place. I would approach the door with great caution, and the first individual that I encountered, I would be very leery of, and as I determined what had taken place and realized that this was at this point safe to move forward, finding that the person who did the shooting, I would then begin a series of questioning. Uh, supposing now that this person is dead, I would make a sufficient check of that individual to realize that he is dead or that uh, he needs some type of hospitalization. But my concern as a police officer would become involved with what that individual who did the shooting has to say. Mm -hmm. How I perceive him, what's being told to me, how I feel, was he justified or unjustified in the action? What were the circumstances that caused him to discharge that weapon as someone entered his home? If you were the person who had just shot an intruder, what should you say to the police when they ask you what happened? You should be cooperative. Stick to the facts. Don't attempt to convince the police officers that you're innocent or guilty at that stage. You won't be able to do it. And all you'll be able to do by expanding on the facts, the bare facts, is to make statements that later could incriminate you, could convict you. And I've seen that case after case after case where the bare facts are insufficient for the purposes of convicting the person. But they've made statements. And based on those statements, we've gotten contradictory facts. And now with those contradictory facts, we've convicted them. You tell the police officer what the facts were. All right. A, I was asleep. I went downstairs uh, after I heard glass break. I, I saw an individual uh, coming through. He had an object in his hand. Uh, I yelled, stop. He turned towards me, and I shot. Those are the facts. Right? Leave it at that. Don't start saying, as I was coming down the stairs, my wife was asleep upstairs, and she had had a problem with a guy following her around. And uh, my son, had had a fight with the neighbor. And I thought maybe that be, might be the neighbor coming in because he had gone down there and thrown a brick through his window. Don't elaborate. Don't guess. Don't suppose. Don't conclude. Stick to the facts because what you conclude could hang you. What you know won't. But it will all be in that report. And later on, you won't remember making those statements. But I, I've seen report after report where when we go through it, we find a conflict between what the person said and what the subsequent facts develop. And we say that's murder. This is not a self-defense situation. And that's how most of them are proved. What will happen if someone refuses to talk and just asks for an attorney? Well, at that point, uh, I think it's a sense of calming the individual down. I'm sure he'll say something to you, even if he wants his lawyer. Uh, very few people will not want to relate 
something about the experience that they just shared. Uh, if he told me he wanted a lawyer, I would feel that he's got something to hide. Because at this point, again, most people want to talk about what has just happened. It's a traumatic event in their life that doesn't happen on a daily occurrence, and they're going to want to talk about it. Someone that doesn't is going to strike me as someone that has something to hide. Now, if you're arrested, immediately they'll advise you your rights. And at that point, you say, I don't know anything about rights, but you just told me not to say anything, so I'm going to take your word for it. And then you shut your mouth, and you get your phone call, you contact your attorney. And my attorney in this case is somebody that's competent. The guy that does your will or close your real estate deal is not the guy to call. You need somebody that is familiar with the criminal system and uh, has a predisposition to look favorably upon your situation as it exists. Another person with a great deal of knowledge and experience on the subject is Sergeant Alan Kulovitz of the Cook County Sheriff's Department, which covers the unincorporated area around Chicago. Sergeant Kulovitz, with over 21 years as a police officer, is well known in the law enforcement community for his investigative skills and is currently the commander of the Cook County SWAT team. Uh, Sergeant Kulovitz has worked 14 years as an evidence technician investigating major crimes. I talked to him about what he would ask a homeowner who had just shot someone. Well, basically, I want to know just what happened. All right, uh, how did the person get in that position and, and uh, what were the circumstances involved? Uh, and if the person said, I shot him, I mean, if he's been Moran, or even if he makes the statement ahead of time, I shot him, and uh, then I realize that he's, in fact, the suspect, we're going to Mirandize him, advise him of self-incrimination, all of this type, of, and he waives those rights at that time. And then I said, okay, you, sh you know, what happened? Just give me the story. Let me know what, uh, uh, let's start at point A and go through at point B. And uh, this is the big thing with, uh, here again, when I talked to you earlier as an evidence tech, as two and two making four, uh, when I listen to a story, I have to visualize in my mind, as they're telling me what happened, I have to see it happen in my mind's eye. I would just imagine, I would look at the scene and I would see, and I have to know every angle the person was standing, the distance they were standing, uh, what was the movement of the, of the offender, was he moving forward, was he moving backwards, whatever, There's the whole thing. Now I've got him locked into a story. Once I've got him locked into a statement and I've got him locked into a story, then I can go look at the physical evidence and see if the physical evidence present um, supports the statements being made. All right. If you don't have somebody locked into a story where they can start, well, no, no, that wasn't how it happened at all. I wasn't here. I was over there. And they start changing their story on you. Seeing that here again now, red flags go up. Uh, something's wrong. I'll bet a lot of you out there are wondering about the advice you've heard for years. You know, the one where some guy says, hell, if you shoot him outside, just drag him back inside. Now, I asked Sergeant Kulovitz if he'd heard that. Yes, that's, uh, that seems to be a, uh, an old wives' tale that's very popular in this country. Everywhere I've gone, it's, it's become part of our folklore. Uh, and any time I have the opportunity to uh, dispel the, the myth about it, uh, I like to express that uh, to, uh, to uh, people that uh, it's, it's not a good idea. I, I, everywhere I've gone and people I've talked to, uh, I've never heard anybody say that they never heard that if you shoot somebody in your house, or and they run outside, or if you shoot somebody and they fall outside a window, you know, if a burglar's crawling through a window and you shoot him and he falls outside, make sure you drag him back inside. And of course, this uh, this couldn't be farther from uh, an accepted practice. That you possibly is very bad because what's happening is uh, is uh, you're 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 saying that you you believe you did something wrong, and now you're going to cover it up. You're going to take a bad thing and make it right. And uh, any police officer, any investigator, any anybody that's got any experience at all is going to see from the physical evidence uh, that, uh, uh, or the position of the body or whatever, you know, I mean, it's just everything that makes up a crime scene is going to see that you have made a overt attempt to alter a crime scene. And then right there, you're, you're, you're admitting that you've done something wrong and you're trying to cover it up. And you may not have done anything wrong at all. You may be totally and completely uh, justified under the law uh, in your actions, completely legal, but uh, now you're going to cast some shadow of doubt or, um, uh, and especially of course with police officers, they have a natural uh, sense of uh, uh, distrust anyways. I mean, it's just, it's natural to the job. I mean, it's like everybody you deal with, or not everybody, but uh, a vast majority of your clientele 
lie <laughs> uh, a lot. And so when you run into, you, you tend to start to believe that every time you deal with anybody in a official capacity, uh, they may be lying to you. And so now if you have, if you see proof of this, if you ask somebody what happened and they tell you a story and you look at the crime scene, you look at the evidence present, and especially if it's just flagrant, and I've seen some cases where it was just absolutely flagrant, it, was, it wasn't even subtle, you know, there was nothing, it was just, it was completely wrong. And in most cases that's the way it is. I mean, because people, when I say people, the average citizen walking around just watching television and seeing movies uh, has got a misconception of, first of all, what an actual crime scene looks like, and secondly, uh, has really no conceptual idea of what we look for at a crime scene. And uh, so for them to try to alter it in any way would be uh, foolish, be very foolish. Sergeant Kulovitz showed me some crime scene photos of an actual drag them back inside case. The incident occurred, uh, well, the incident occurred in a, uh, in a low income area and um, uh, it was a store owner uh, who had been ripped off many times and uh, had had several burglaries occurred in his, in his business and, and uh, was just tired of, uh, of, of being uh, burglarized. Now he had all kinds of bars and whatnot on the windows, but um, he stayed there at nighttime, uh, slept in the bed, wherever, had a shotgun, and uh, three individuals uh, broke into the place and uh, were stealing some merchandise, you know, committing, an act, uh, committing a burglary. And um, he um, uh, approached the offenders in the building, in the building at the time. Apparently they all, well obviously they all took off. They went out the door. The door they broke into, they took off. He chased after them and he, um, uh, he fired. He fired at one of them, hit him in the head with a shotgun, took him down. One shot to the head, he went down. And this was in a parking lot. It's a gravel parking lot. He then took a uh, carpet, a length of section of carpet from the, um, uh, from by the cash register, took it out into the parking lot, rolled the body onto the carpet, and then dragged the carpet and the body back inside. And this, of course, like I said, is a gravel parking lot. So you've got stones, you've got drag marks from the stones, and, and of course with the carpeting it just uh, it amplified everything. Dragged it in and put it right in front of the cash register, and that's where it was. The door was open and there's blood. Now the proceeds were still laying in the parking lot. The blood was on the gravel in the parking lot. The drag marks came right in, I mean, just long thing, and he sat there. And when he was asked what happened, he said that he was confronted by this bad guy and shot him in front of the cash register. And when he was asked, well, what about, what about all of this? He goes, I don't know about that. I shot him right here. And that was his story. And he wasn't going to change from one bit. I, I don't know about any of that, but I shot him right here. And um, unfortunately, I think if he would have, I per now this is my opinion, I personally feel that if he would have just stayed with the incident as it occurred and not try to alter it, because what it, in fact, what happened is now it looked like uh, uh, there was a real, here again, they didn't say, well, from point A to point C, everything was fine, but at point C, he went bad. They just disregarded everything and said, well, obviously, if he lied about this little part here, he must have lied about everything. And uh, I really feel that instead of having a uh, justifiable incident, they ended up charging him with murder. It was later reduced to an involuntary manslaughter, and, and uh, the man was placed on three years of felony probation, but he still has a felony conviction. Dick Saldin is very familiar with the dangers of not telling the truth. Well, let me give you some very good advice. Don't fabricate. Whatever the facts are that go down, live by those facts. Don't fabricate. Nobody short of a professional criminal has the ability to be on that stand on the cross-examination and hold together a fabric that is not true. It's impossible. I, I have cross-examined thousands of people, and if they lied, it was obvious. So you can't fabricate. Point. And there's a jury instruction to that effect. If a person lies in one material aspect, he's to be distrusted in all others. So uh, you drag the body in, and there's a bit of blood out in the sidewalk. You're dead. You may have a totally justifiable shooting out there in the sidewalk. Or maybe you have sympathetic police officers that are going to make it a justifiable shooting because of the person you shot. But it's tough to cover up the blood in the sidewalk when the body's inside. 
Okay, so much for dragging them back inside. Now that you are aware how the police will respond to your having shot someone, let's back up to discuss the type of situation that would have brought the police there in the first place. Here's the situation. You were sleeping. A noise woke you up. You get a gun and come face to face with a burglar. You've already learned that you can't shoot someone if he starts to run away, but could you chase after him? Uh, the situation that will happen, though, at some point you're going to confront him. And now if he, does, uh, if he doesn't fall into one of the categories, one, that uh, by allowing him to continue to flee, that he constitutes an immediate danger to other people, or, or future danger to other people, or two, that now he constitutes, uh, in your mind, a threat of great bodily injury to yourself. Uh, you can't just run him down and say you're under arrest, he says the hell with you, and put a bullet between his eyes. That's murder. Okay? So you're in the same position a police officer is. If you want to make that arrest, you're going to have to escalate that force the way a police officer does. You know, first they say you're under arrest. Then they try to put handcuffs on you. And if they have to, they hit you with a baton. And finally, if, if you do something that threatens their life, then they take their gun out. Now, if you're prepared to go through those steps when you chase this man out of your house, go ahead and do it. But don't expect to get him in an alley, and he says, all right, what are you going to do now? And you squeeze the trigger. Because at that point, uh, you'd be guilty of murder. Chasing a burglar, Seldine believes, is just not a good idea. Uh, I would say if you have a burglar that runs away, you get a description of him, you tell the police. And you save yourself $100,000 worth of legal fees, your home, you probably save yourself uh, a criminal sentence. There's nothing good is going to come out of that. You don't have the experience to make that arrest. You're not going to be able to do it. And maybe the guy's armed, and you go trotting after him, you get killed. Right? When you find out, it's too late. And you just can't uh, get your high-powered rifle with a scope on it and say, okay, when he turns that corner, I've got him. You can't do that. So you should not chase him. The uh, consequences are just, uh, you're safe now. Whatever's been done as far as property being taken has been taken. If you have insurance, fine. If you don't, just chalk it up. It's a lot cheaper. Two common questions I was often asked when I was a police officer concerned firing warning shots and shooting just to wound someone. Jeff talks about shooting to wound. You're using deadly force, whether you break that individual's leg with that shot or whether you shoot him to the heart. You are using deadly force against that person, and it's either the correct when I say correct, it's either justifiable or it's not. There is no halfway. I only meant to wound him a little bit. No way. Nobody who has any knowledge about what they're talking about would suggest that, in my opinion. When you discharge your firearm at that person, you must have the justification under the law to use deadly force. Whether you're successful, when I say successful, that's probably not the right term. Whether you, that shot leads to the death of that individual or not doesn't matter. Deadly force is the discharging of that firearm at that person. And you better darn well have been legally justified in doing it. I asked Dick Seldine if he knew of anyone ever prosecuted for killing someone instead of just wounding him. I don't, I've never had a case where uh, we tried a person because they could have wounded instead of killing. But you ask the question in that sense, and I, I Legally, theoretically, that could happen. If I tell the uh, district attorney or tell the police officer that uh, I just shot to wound him, then the question is, did I have to shoot at all? Uh, was, I, was I really in that fear of my life that I had the ability to reflect on where to place that bullet and judge the circumstances? Uh, was the threat so imminent? Was it about to occur with such devastation that I had no choice but to kill? Right. When you shoot the wound, it implies that there is still some time span, maybe some distance span, available between the perpetrator that I've shot and the ultimate death or injury to myself. So you could get into a problem on that. And I think the bottom line is that if you really fill the criteria of self-defense, all you want to do is survive, and you're not that concerned except to survive, and that's the test. Are you in great bodily, uh, fear of great bodily injury or death? Mm -hmm. 
very good advice. And on the advisability of firing warning shots? <laughs> if you know where the bullet's going, I would say, and now what we're getting away from is uh, I'm moving now into the courtroom where you're on the stand and you say the person was advancing or these two people were advancing. I was cut off and I fired a shot in the air to show them I had the gun and the gun was loaded. I think that helps you with the jury. Uh, you, you take that vis-a-vis -vis the police training that says you never fire a warning shot. If you shoot, you shoot to kill. And of course that's a policy dictate because they don't want bullets flying around. And every time a bullet leaves a police officer's gun is a potential lawsuit. That's the last thing the city fathers want. And uh, with a private citizen, if it's a, there's a situation that is near to being uh, a deadly force confrontation, but not quite, I think there might be some circumstances for firing a warning shot. However, uh, if you fire a shot and you're not justified, that's a crime. You could be guilty of assault with a deadly weapon or exhibiting a firearm or half a dozen other crimes. So uh, firing a warning shot, uh, if you end up killing them and you fire the warning shot first, I'd say it probably would help you with the jury. But again, uh, we're talking practical and theoretical. Now you're going to see dramatic recreations of criminal events, and you'll have a chance to test your ability to recognize when the use of deadly force is and is not justified. We'll start with a simple incident. Watch carefully for the point at which the use of deadly force is clearly justified. Please settle down. Hey, we someone thank in you car. for joining someone us. Someone in your car. Been you you know, good, look. Got a yeah, someone from your car. I saw him out there. See, I saw him. Who's in the car? Come on. There's someone there. Look. Just look. Oh, my God. Son of a bitch. I don't need this. Who the hell is that? What's he doing? I don't know. Who's that? I'm going to do something about it. What are you going to do? Just stop. No, put shit. that away. No, what are you gonna do? Honey, honey. Honey, what are you doing in my car? Get out of my car! I'm an asshole! Honey, 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 let's call the police. He took my stereo. I know, well, we'll just call the police. Calm down. We'll just call the police. Come on. I'm not gonna lose another stereo, come on. We can get another stereo. Come on. Did you find the point? How about here, where the man has obviously removed an item from the victim's car and is now making a run to escape apprehension? Or how about here, I'm an where the criminal has deliberately and wantonly taunted the victim with profanity during the commission of a crime? Okay, okay. Did we trick anyone? No. At no point in the scene you just saw was there any justification for the use of deadly force? Absolutely not. It's pure property crime. No threat of force against him or his wife. No indication that that individual wants to do anything but get away. Make him angry? Absolutely. Does he want to shoot him? Absolutely. Is he justified under the law as far as the state of Illinois? Absolutely not. Just goes back to our same consideration. Law doesn't uh, make ju law doesn't justify anger as far as uh, being a defense for uh, shooting someone. Okay, what about taking the shotgun along for self-defense while you chase after the thief? When I'm doing my instruction, one of the rules that I stand by is that things aren't what they always appear to be. What you see as being the truth or the the action may not be what somebody else sees. Let's take the example: we have the man who rushes to the door when he sees his car being burglarized, the stereo is being torn out, his wife's standing there, and he has a shotgun. He rushes off down the street. Question was, why shouldn't he chase him? Police get the call. His wife calls, which is the thing she should do. They see a man with a shotgun or some type of firearm racing after another individual. Now, as they pull up on the scene, what's that citizen going to do? We had this exact incident happen in, in real time. It, police confront a man with a shotgun. They order him to drop the gun. He doesn't do it. They came literally you know, fractional moments away from killing him, shooting him. 
Why? Because he doesn't think he's done anything wrong. The ordinary citizen in pursuit of somebody they consider to be the bad guy says, hey, I haven't done anything wrong. Why should I throw down my weapon? In the real case, it was about a $1,200 trap gun, very expensive shotgun. He wasn't going to throw it in the dirt. And he came to, close to losing his life because his perception was he was in the right. Police officer's perception, we have an armed defender, and he's not doing what we're telling him to do. Now you're going to see a scene with five variations, five different endings. Each one will give you an opportunity to think and analyze. Fuck, I'm back and standing to get to be around here. Beer, man. Yeah, what do you want with more beer? Go talk back and stand. Where's your money at, man? Hey, who's this asshole? Come on, Weasel, man. Be cool, man. Yeah, you're my mama. Watch. Weasel, you don't even have a problem, man. Be cool. Okay, Mom. Okay, Mom. No problem. Weasel, just cool out, man. My partner? Let him come down here? Top neighborhood to get around and you might need directions, you know what I mean? Hey look, just get the fuck out of my way, will you? Just get the fuck Ooh. out of my way! Was Frank the businessman with the pickup truck? Was he justified in shooting? No, of course he was not justified in shooting. And by now, I hope you can explain why. From the way the scene was presented, Frank's motivation for shooting did not arise from a reasonable fear for his life or for great bodily injury, but from what? From anger. All right, let's see another way Frank could have handled it. I need some more beer, man. That's what I want. Yeah, with marshmallow. Who's this son Marshmallow is a bitch. beer, man. Hey, check this out. What's up, man? We're gonna have some fun. It's gonna be a What's lot of fun. Hey, what? Man, just cool out, weasel. Okay, mom. Hey, mom. Hey, mom. Just, hey, weasel. Just be cool, man. Cool. How you doing, partner? Hey, come on, man. You looking for an address? There's a lot of folks hey, around here. You get the fuck out of my way. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, I didn't mean anything by it. Just... Just stay back. Don't screw up, okay? Just... Be cool, man. You son of a bitch. Did it. Fucking got a gun, man. Where are you going to take care of from, Weasel? I don't have a finish idea. What the fuck are you letting people hey, run out of guns for, man? Look over here trying to shoot us, man. You know, get to call the cops, man. Get to call the cops, man. Get to call the cops, Stop me! Get to call the cops, man. Asshole! I'll get his license plate number, man. His license number, I'm gonna be on that dude, man. We get to call the cops on this cat, right, man. Right, man. Let's call the cops. Let's call the Let's cops, cops on now. Come on, ass, come on. Man. Did that seem to be a reasonable response to being hassled? Let's hear Deputy Chief Costelny's opinion. It's not justified, and I think it's it's poorly used. Uh, if you use a weapon just to display it. Uh, you're getting, you're possibly getting yourself into more of a problem with the situation. The other, the individual did not have a weapon. He didn't display a weapon. Uh, he was merely in your way. For you to pull a weapon on him in, in terms to try and get by him is definitely wrong on your part. Who's to say that his friend didn't have a handgun or a shotgun leaned up against the wall? And when you pulled your handgun out, he picks up the shotgun behind the dumpster and shoot you right on the spot, mainly because you pulled a handgun on his friend. And as to what would happen when the slime balls called the police to report having a gun pulled on them? This becomes a pretty common occurrence. This happens quite a bit as far as police work. 
we receive calls a lot of times from people who have seen someone else with a gun and such a situation might have occurred in just what we viewed in the tape. An individual displayed the weapon in order he felt that it was protecting him to get him out of a situation and in turn what it does is send the police after him. These two individuals then call the police, say he's got a firearm, the police get a description of his vehicle, stop him, and if that person would react wrong with the firearm at the time, the police stop him, wrong in a sense that he just moves funny, you might have a new officer that uh, might not uh, view him as just an average person. And however you or I may sympathize with Frank, once stopped by the police for threatening someone with a gun, he will almost certainly be arrested and in many areas he can count on being prosecuted. Okay, Get let's see another way away. Frank could handle the Get situation. Son of a bitch! What the fuck are you doing? Get it! Oh! Ah. Hey, hey, please! Shut up! Please! <laughs> <laughs> As most of you know, there are people among us who don't worry about laws and rules and regulations. And of course, there's a lesson in that. That's right. If, uh, if you're carrying a gun, and that's a, a, a ironclad rule, I don't, <laughs> you want a, one of the Ten Commandments when we just made them up. Uh, you carry a gun, you do not get in fights. You avoid confrontations. Because if a confrontation begins and you use lethal force where it's a mutual confrontation, you're guilty of murder. You cannot start a fight. And in the, before I carried a gun, as a young man, I'd be inclined maybe to get upset at somebody who did something and maybe uh, get involved in a fight. I think when I was 18, 19 years old, I'd get in a fight over things. I wonder why. Once I started carrying a gun, I never had a fight again the rest of my life. Because I knew that if something happened that was serious, I'd kill him. And short of that, there was no need to get in this fight. And if I did get in this fight and he got my gun, I'm dead. And if I take the gun out, he's dead and I go to prison. So you have to avoid uh, mutual combat if you're carrying a gun. Weasel, do it to him, man. Do it to him, man. Go. Go, man. Go. Go, man. What about that one? Was Frank legally justified in shooting before that brick came down into his face? Yes. In this scene, Frank did, in my opinion, have a very reasonable fear for his life or great bodily injury when he looked up at that brick. But there's another larger issue here we should discuss. And let's not forget that while Frank did act within the law to protect himself from death or very serious injury, Frank is not a hero. He did what he had to do to protect himself. But there's more to consider than just a good legal defense. Now, Jeff Chudwin has some valuable insights beyond the issue of what is and isn't a legal defense. My position in this is we're not trying to build defenses because what that indicates is that somebody's been charged. We're trying to tell people, look, avoid trouble, avoid problems, avoid altercations. Even when you think your honor has been besmirched, when you, you, know, you feel that your manhood has been put in question, you walk away, especially and I want to say that especially if you're in possession of a firearm because it's reasonable to see that those things will lead to escalation of force and could easily end up in that firearm being used either against that individual or being used against the man who had it. When he's down on the ground and that man picks up that large brick which at that point is surely a dangerous weapon because it crushes skull without difficulty in the hands of a average man and he starts to bring it up indicating he's going to bring it down on this man's head then he has, in my opinion, the right to defend himself. And if that defense includes deadly force, 
so be it. But again, it's going to still come back to what happened beforehand. And I still want to tell you that I don't think it was right for him to engage in a physical confrontation that precipitated this action. And perhaps that scenario that you have indicated and illustrated is a good teaching scenario because we don't want people precipitating that type of action. We can see what it leads to. In this case, it led to somebody being shot. Disengagement may not sound romantic, may not be honorable in some people's minds. Get away. Well, let's see what Frank could have done. <laughs> that looks pretty good on you. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, come on. Come on. You're not leaving. Oh, come on, man. Hey, buddy. Check it out, man. <laughs> come back anytime. Hey, man. Check hey. it out, man. Hey. Bye-bye. <laughs> Later, dude. <laughs> ah, give me five. Oh, All right. right. You asshole. You asshole. That's right. Get y'all. Get on. Come on. Ah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> give me a marshmallow. Does that make you mad? It's kind of disgusting, isn't it? I don't like it either. And as a former cop, I know that allowing those slime balls to get away with that stuff will encourage them into more aggressive acts next time. But I have to tell you that walking away is the best way to keep out of trouble. Now we're going to hear from another group of experts on the subject of firearms, self-defense, and criminal acts. You're going to meet some people who know exactly what they're talking about because they've been there. They've done it. These are criminals, the guys you worry about. All the people interviewed here are incarcerated felons, most of whom are awaiting trial or sentencing. All were selected for interview because of their substantial criminal experiences, and in particular because they had incidents with armed citizens. Now, instead of speculating on how they may regard an armed citizen in the use of firearms for self-defense, I thought it would be valuable for you to learn their perspective directly. Let's listen to some of their experiences. First is Mr. Wilson. I did everything from A to Z. <laughs> um, robberies, burglaries, purse snatching. Um, I mean, everything. I mean, car, car burglary. Um, just point blank, just walk to somebody and just take their money, I mean, which is robbery. But, um, all of it is it's not worth it, but still in all, i done it. Well, about in 30 years, I have no pride in this, but I'm going to say it, but I've been going back and forth to jail since I was 11. I have about 15 years of my life in jail, and it's not nothing to brag about, but I've done it. I've been there, so it doesn't happen. Wilson is awaiting sentencing for attempted murder. I even done a burglary once before. Um, I was in the house, and um, the man came on, the man, the woman, and the kids. And I didn't hear him. So I stacked the, uh, the VCR on top of the TV and a little money bank and picked it all up. I'm afraid to leave. Well, the man came home, and when the man came home, you know, he yelled, ah, and I yelled, ah, you know, and I dropped everything, and I ran and jumped clean through the window. You know, I didn't get a scratch or cut or nothing. I just rolled on the ground and jumped up and ran. And um, that was an experience that, I don't know, you just have to bend through it yourself to, to get the fright out of it. And um, it's, it was overwhelming. It's, it's, Scary. Okay, um, another time I, I did a burglary. I was in the house and um, I went in the room and didn't know nobody was in the house. And um, I started unplugging stuff, TV and the stereo and all that. And this thing, you know, I feel something cold back here on my neck. It was a barrel of a 38. And when I felt that barrel, only thing I can do was. I turned around, you know, it was a lady. Did you say something when she turned Don't shoot. She didn't want to shoot because she didn't want to kill nobody. 
Okay, so I just started walking away, say, please, lady, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot, and broke. I broke and ran. I was gone. From that point on, that happened in 83. I've never been back in nobody, nobody's house since then. Yeah. That experience didn't keep him from committing crimes, but it did keep him from doing burglaries. I asked him, as well as several others who had faced armed citizens, what effect such an incident had upon them. What crosses your mind is your life, okay? You don't actually see death, but you can feel it. You feel it through your body, okay? You get chills. Even when that gun, the barrel of that gun wasn't on me, you get chills running through your body. It had a tremendous effect on me as far as going in people's houses or doing anything that was illegal that could get a gun pulled on me. So I learned from that point on that my life is too valuable than to go out to, to party with the money that I steal or, or put on my car or whatever. I asked if most of his friends fear armed citizens. Well, um, a lot of times when I used to go out, we call it hustling. Um, when I used to go out and hustle, a lot of, a lot of them would say, uh, I don't think we should do this one. It might be a gun in there, somebody might be at home. They would never not want to go in. They would be scared to go in first. Okay, so it wasn't a point of um, if they ever seen a gun there, it was a point if anybody there, and if somebody there, most likely they had a gun. You know, so that's the main problem there. But none of them would say, uh, no, nah, well, I seen him with a gun yesterday or nothing like that, but they would be scared to go in first. I think they feel that every house that they get ready to burglarize has a gun, even though it may not be one there. It's just a fear of death because you're taking a chance. You know, it's more of a chance than you would imagine. I asked Roland what he thought would happen if the guys on the street knew that no homeowner owned a gun. Oh, this would be chaos. It would be chaos. I would have me one because I know what's going to happen. And I don't even carry guns. But I know the impact that having guns outlaw, that would be just inviting people to come Come rob me. Come take this from me. You know, I ain't got no gun. You know it. That would be bad. Another informed opinion comes from Mr. Harmon, who has been a professional burglar for most of his life. Once I was doing a burglary, and I knew whose house it was. I, had, I was with a friend. And I was on one side of the house, and he was on another. And all of a sudden, I heard start hearing some noise out back. Is my friend getting beat up. Instead of jumping the fence, and I went back there to try to help him. And uh, the guy didn't really beat me up. He kept beating my friend up. I knew the guy. Then all of a sudden, he went inside the house and got a 12-gauge shotgun pointed at him. He's going to blow my head off. I got so scared, I peed my pants. Right? Yeah. But uh, he didn't shoot nobody. He let us go. But, you know, it scared me for a long time. I broke into a house, and I, I was going through, I went through every room, every door. I, I go up, before I open the door, I, I kind of stepped to the side a little bit and opened it. Well, I went to the side, went to open the door, it was locked, and then a gun went off. Hmm. What, what, did it hit you? No, I got, I got, I got caught for that burglary, though, because I froze up. What happened? What happened then? After the guy came out, pulled the gun on me, made me get down, hit me a few times, called the police. Yeah, yeah, Russ Burger. Yeah, scared the hell out of me. I thought he was gonna kill me. But you ever think about taking it away from him? Oh no, uh, there was no possible way I could have. I think he would have shot me. But after that, any time I do a burglary, I always got a weapon with me, like a, mainly a sawed-off shotgun. I'm not looking to kill nobody or shoot nobody, but it just makes me feel a little better more secure, I should say, when I'm in the house. I asked him what he would do if he found someone at home. Oh, I wouldn't shoot him. Just like I've been in burglaries with a shotgun and somebody come home, I'll try to get away without them seeing me before, you know. Like I was doing a burglary a while back and 
I seen a cop pull up in front of the house. And I just, before he even seen me, I left with the gun. I still kept my gun, run down the street with my sawed-off shotgun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't shoot anybody? In Not unless I, it came to me or them. If they pulled a gun on me or, or if they tried to stop me. <laughs> Harmon remembered one time when the thought of an armed citizen made him think. The only time uh, uh, it's, it kind of lured me off, I didn't rob a house when I was, I was through a neighborhood looking to rob a house. <coughs> and I seen a sign that said, uh, this house protected by Smith and Western. It kind of clicked in my head, you know. Well, hey, this guy will blow me away. He catch me in his house. So those signs do work? Signs, well, it, it, I, I avoided that house. At first, I thought, well, hey, there's, gun, there's probably all kinds of guns in the house. And I thought, well, this guy happens to be home. You know, most likely, he'll blow my head off. So I just, you know, skipped that house. Mr. Johnson has a history of robberies and drug sales, but his specialty was burglary. I bur burglarized, burglarized about years, about at least. Seven, eight years ago, I turned to selling drugs. I was burglarizing a car one day at night, and my friend was in his car, and I was outside burglarizing the car, and he said, come on, let's go. Somebody looking out the window. So when I was coming out, when I was coming out the car shutting it, hit some gunshot, pow, pow, pow. One shot me in the shoulder, but we got away. And Johnson did worry about armed citizens. Uh, yeah, somebody might, somebody might be at home. Yeah. Somebody could be asleep. He was asked what he thought the effect would be if homeowners were not allowed to have guns. I think the criminals would have guns because they get it by stealing them. And then like the homeowners, they wouldn't have nothing to protect themselves with. You think it's a good idea for a homeowner to have a gun? Yeah. For yeah, because I know if, if I was in there and uh, somebody's in there, I might have to do something to them. Mr. Walker is also a professional criminal. His specialties are burglaries and robberies. Oh, I, I've robbed liquor stores, people on the streets. Uh, okay. I was robbing a person on the streets, and I pulled a gun, and they pulled a gun back. Mm -hmm. We were, we were in like a standoff. We're like, you know, it's like I'm robbing you, know you're not, you know? And it's like, I'm like, well, what do I do? You know, I don't want to shoot nobody, you know? And I don't think they want to shoot me. So we stand there for a few minutes and I like, well, okay, put my gun up and leave. Just, just walked away or what? No, I ran. I asked Walker why he thought the guy didn't shoot him. I don't, I don't think the average person wants those hassles. It's, you know, if he'd shot me then, or if he'd kill me then, he would have to go through the court system or, or the, people don't want those hassles. Walker said he didn't feel the need to shoot his victim. No, because I was in commission of a crime if I shoot him. That's life, and I don't want to hurt nobody. You know, my, if, if I'm robbing somebody, I'm, my intentions ain't to hurt nobody. My intentions are to, you know, just get some money. I was pulling a burglary one time, and was in a person's living room, maybe sleep. And I was crawling around on the floor, and I was in the living room unconnecting some equipment, and turned around, and the man standing there with a gun. And he like, you know, like, wow. I, I didn't have no weapon that time. And I was like, you know, what's going on? What he said? Yeah, he, what are you doing in here? You know, like, dog, and I'm shocked. I'm, you know, like, blew away, like, you know, because all of a sudden here I am looking out of a barrel of a gun, you know, out of nowhere in the dark. Mm. So, he never shot neither. I ran out of, out of the door, you know, shot. In spite of his experiences, Walker believes honest citizens should have firearms for self-defense. Yeah. Why? For protection. 
I mean, because say, for instance, okay, you know, I could have been, like, when I was in that person's house, then I could have been uh, a, you know, a psycho or something, you know? Yeah. I could have been out to hurt them, right. you know? And then he would have had the gun, so he would have been able to protect himself, mm -hmm. you know? But I just, I wasn't into that. Sure. Yeah. Well, what, what Mr. Moreland describes himself as a thief. He prefers breaking into stores and businesses at night because of an experience he once had breaking into a residence. Me and these friends were living together, pulling burglaries, and I just happened to come across this one place where I was going to go through the back door or the back of the house window, and I, I got the window open with a screwdriver, and I started to climb in, and I seen a figure there. And I couldn't tell if he had a gun or a knife or whatever. So I thought, well, it's about time to get out of here. Next thing I know it, I started running. Next thing I know it, I heard a couple gunshots. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was picked up about a half hour afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I don't mess around with burglaries like people's houses. You know, could that deter you from the other one? Sure it did. Sure it did. I don't want to get killed. <laughs> Like his colleagues, Moreland believes that without the threat of firearms, criminals like him would be more active. I think I, you'd probably have a lot more burglaries. There wouldn't be too much to fear. A gun is a good reason to fear doing a burglary, I would feel. I asked him if just the idea that someone might have a gun is a deterrent to crime. Just the idea that someone might have a gun? Yeah. Yeah, that would have a big effect on you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you see those little posters or stickers in the windows uh, uh, with guns nowadays if you come in and, you know, mm -hmm. I don't remember what the yeah. sticker says, but, you know, that's enough to deter somebody sometimes. I mean, me it is because I don't want to get shot. I value life too much, mm -hmm. you know, and I know if somebody broke into my place and I had a gun, I'd probably shoot them and wouldn't even think nothing about it, you know? And I know if I think that way, there's other people out there that think that way too. Well, we certainly learn that these guys are very worried about guns being used against them, and that the mere threat or suggestion of an armed citizen is often enough to deter them. Now, Mr. Rowland, the first man interviewed, went so far as to suggest that he thought armed citizens should take a class to teach them to give a burglar a chance to run before they started shooting. I think all of them should be, which I know is like just about impossible, should be talked to by someone before they be allowed to buy a gun, to use this gun in such a way to cause a death. They should be talked to? Yeah. What should they be told? I mean, what would you do with this gun if somebody come in your house? Would you warn them you got a gun or would you just start shooting? Mm -hmm. For instance, a friend of mine was shot in the back three times recently, three weeks ago, for breaking in the house. He had no warning. Maybe if somebody would have warned, hey, look, I got a gun, they would have left. But he wasn't warned. And this guy who killed him was only 21 years old. The man died, was about 32, 33. He lost his life trying to go get some money. You've heard these men say that once confronted by an armed homeowner, a criminal's most likely reaction is to immediately make a run for it. But remember, we're talking about the more common criminals, not the relatively much more rare psychos or maniacs like we saw in the first dramatic scene. But you should never, never, never assume that a criminal will turn and run once confronted, whether or not you're armed. Mr. Charles, a man who knows violent criminals very well, makes an important point. Well, yeah, it's back to the old theory, though. But if you, if you back somebody into a corner, they're going to come out. And if, and, if, and if somebody's burglarizing your house, they know how much time it carries generally. You know, and they're talking years in prison. You know, and, and they're talking about years going into a violent situating, situation, a setting. And if you back them into a corner, they're going to come out of it most of the time. They're going to try to get away from you. And, if, and, if, and, and like I said before, it, a lot of them are going to come at you and try to take the gun from you instead of running because they're not, they're not sure if you're going to shoot them or not. So they're going to be passive or whatever and tell, them, tell, tell you that they're sorry and try to get close to you enough so that they can take the gun from you. Put them on the floor face down immediately and don't let them move. 
you've heard quite a bit from a number of experts on both sides of the law. And my purpose here is to show you what you might be up against from the criminal justice point of view to that of the criminals. But we're not through yet. There's still another dimension to self-defense, civil liability. You know what that means, being sued. Now, I asked Dick Seldin if someone in the Los Angeles area could expect to be sued civilly, even if his or her shooting situation were totally justified under criminal law. It depends upon who you shoot. Assuming that the person you shoot has relatives and uh, some connection with the community, it's, it's halfway substantial in the community, you can expect to be sued. If it's a derelict, uh, you know, a wino, a total outlaw type with no relatives, you probably won't be. But if there's a, a family left behind, you probably, in most civilian shootings, could expect to be sued. And uh, in those situations where the person has no criminal record, I almost guarantee it. Why? Why do you guarantee it? Well, it, because the, uh, the line between justifiable, as, as we've seen so far as we're discussing it, it, is so vague that if you have good injuries and the use of a firearm uh, caused those injuries, and the only issue is was it uh, justifiable or not, it depends what you can put on that courtroom for the jury. And there's a lot of money at the end of that line. So uh, if somebody came to me and said I was shot uh, and these were the circumstances, I'd say you probably have a case. I don't know whether the jury will agree or disagree, but you have a case. And it's in the civil courts, it's preponderance of the evidence. <clears throat> in the criminal courts, beyond a reasonable doubt. Which means you just have to get those people in the civil court, and only 9 out of 12 in California. You have to get them to say, the guy shouldn't have pulled the trigger. Now, let's see, the guy's dead, that's worth 200,000. Uh, he would have uh, suffered this, that's worth 100,000, and the money starts adding up. So I would say uh, the chances are you will be sued. And in almost every case that I prosecuted where the individual shot, and there was a claim of self-defense, and the individual shot had no criminal record, there was a lawsuit. In almost every one of those cases was successful. Matter of fact, they're even successful against the police department. You know, and there you have police officers involved in these. What this means is that your likelihood of being sued increases substantially if your shooting case first goes through criminal prosecution. Because this would mean that your local police department and district attorney's office didn't support your use of deadly force in the first place. And anyway, remember, this is America. You don't have to be wrong to be sued. Now, in the beginning of this documentary, I told you to keep in mind that although much of the legal principles discussed here apply throughout the United States, you must be aware that the standards in some states are indeed different. Self-defense is more or less universal in the United States. However, there are states that require that you exhaust all available flight opportunity before you exercise deadly force. And I don't know all the states, I don't want to mention just a few of them, but there's approximately eight of them that have that. The rest of the states follow California where there's no requirement of retreat in order to use deadly force. And basically the difference there is in California, once that threat is there, uh, you can defend yourself at that point. If you were in a, another state that required flight, if you could run into the back room of the house, for example, you'd have to do that. Uh, matter of fact, there's some cases where uh, the person ran into the basement, but they could have run out the basement door and shot him coming down the basement stairs, and they ended up in court in those jurisdictions. So uh, that's basically the only difference in self-defense. And you must be aware that you are responsible for learning your own state's law on self-defense. Well, it, it's uh, an axiom of the law that every citizen is presumed to know the law. And that's true of whatever jurisdiction you're in. And if you ever walk into a law library, you know the fallacy of that, uh, because no one can know all the laws, not even a lawyer. You know, I, we have to pick up these books and go through them every time we get a case, just to make sure it hasn't changed. But the law presumes that you know what the law is. And if you go into a jurisdiction that requires flight, uh, then that's what you'll be judged by. You know, same way you come from, say, a place like uh, Idaho, 
carrying your peacemaker under your coat in the Los Angeles, uh, oh, I didn't know that was illegal. That won't convince any judge. Now, how do you become familiar with your state's use of deadly force laws? Well, some states will spell it out for you in state law. But in my research, I found that by far the most valuable information comes from a collection of legal documents called the criminal jury instructions. Now, these California instructions cover such subjects as justifiable homicide and self-defense, justifiable homicide in the, in the lawful defense of self or another, self-defense not an excuse after adversary disabled, force that may be used in defense of property, and so on. Now, the jury instructions contain the actual words which a judge must read to the jury before it begins deliberations. And when you read them, you'll also be pleased to find out that they are written, unlike most legal documents, in plain, understandable English. They're written in English because they're supposed to be understood by us common folk, the people who make up the juries, not just by lawyers. Although the primary use of the jury instructions is during criminal trials, its words and thoughts reflect your state's current legal doctrine on self-defense and the use of deadly force. And that is the doctrine, the legal thinking, which guides your local police and district attorney's office in their evaluation of a shooting incident. The jury instructions are the bottom line in defining what is and what is not justified. Where do you find these instructions? Well, many states have them compiled and published as a complete set. They should be available in any law library, but in some states, each title will have to be looked up individually. However you find them, they're going to give you much better information than you'll get from Uncle Harry, the attorney, the guys at the gun store, or even from most police officers. And although much of what you've heard and seen here has to do with the legal aspects of when deadly force can be used, I want you to keep some other thoughts in mind. I've had the opportunity over a number of years to see a lot that's taken place in regard to individuals who've acted in self-defense, people who've acted with bad intent, people who've gone out there with the desire to hurt other people. I've seen all different types of responses and endings in this. And when I think about it and I sit down, when I try to distill this down to its pure essence, when I'm going to teach a class, whether it's police officers or, or women from the age of uh, 14 to 84, my feeling is this. And again, I tell people, this is my opinion. You know, formulate your own, but learn before you formulate an opinion. If you don't have to use deadly force, don't. If you can disengage from a situation, whether your pride is hurt, whether your honor is smeared, whether you're angered, whatever it might be, leave. Because we know that when we're under those passions, under those intense emotions, we don't do things that we would ordinarily do. And fear can be just a stronger, stronger emotion than any of those others I've mentioned. Leave. I know it sounds namby-pamby, as somebody said. Oh, come on. You know, you want to be a man, you want to be a woman, you want to have some strength. Show everybody what it's about. There's no honor or glory in the court system in being charged as a criminal. And there's no honor or glory in defending yourself in civil court against something that was either right or wrong, but has yet to be determined. And for those who just want one rule to follow, let's hear again from former prosecutor Dick Seldin. Yeah, I can give you one rule. And if you follow this rule, you're totally justified, that you had a reasonable, good faith belief that you were about to suffer great bodily injury or death. A uh, reasonable belief the surrounding circumstances were such that somebody else looking at those circumstances from your perspective would reach the same conclusion. Uh, immediate, that means now. That doesn't mean the guy's 20 feet away and if he keeps coming. It doesn't mean uh, in five minutes I'm going to possibly in great bodily injury, uh, be in a great bodily injury situation. It means now. It's, it's happening now. And uh, will that reasonable person in those circumstances see it that way. So the rule is very simple. If you know at this point that you're going to suffer great bodily injury or somebody in your family is going to suffer great bodily injury or death, you react to it. But if you mentally start thinking about these things and say at this point or that point is justifiable, you have to look at the whole transaction. And then somebody else is going to interpret that. And as I said before, your story is never going to be told. 
It's going to be the surrounding circumstances. It's going to be what, after the fact, develops. If the guy you shot has a, a criminal record a mile long and uh, has four or five uh, nighttime burglary rapes, you could put 18 bullets in this guy, and nobody is going to say a word about it. But if it's the neighbor's boy who's 12 years old, Jimmy your window to come in, and you put 18 bullets into him, you're going to have a problem in that courtroom. And that had nothing to do with the situation when you confronted the person. But it's what has developed that will put a flavor or a perspective to the shooting that will basically decide whether or not you're going to be charged with murder or you're not. I want to emphasize again that my purpose here is not to encourage the lawful use of deadly force, nor to discourage its use, but only to make you aware of the considerations involved in using a firearm in self-defense. It's a very serious subject, both in terms of the legal considerations, as well as each person's moral and psychological ones. Now, it's a subject which is, for some reason, almost unmentionable in many political and social arenas, in spite of the fact that using deadly force to defend oneself is an everyday occurrence. And it is a right recognized in every country throughout the world. Now, it's my hope and intention that you will now be better prepared intellectually to make your own decision should the time ever come when you may have to use deadly force.